Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. Welcome back to the podcast, friends. Today, we are diving into Chapter 10 of The Religious Potential of the Child by Sophia Cavaletti. This is an amazing chapter. This is all about the method of signs. And this chapter is so much of the why and the how to what is Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. At the very beginning of this chapter, Sophia says, the method is not like an empty box that can be filled with anything whatsoever. The method has a soul, and this soul should correlate to the content that is being transmitted through the method. Between method and content, there should be a profound accord, an affinity of nature. Otherwise, there is the risk of distorting the content. This is our why. This, and I go on, I have the whole next paragraph highlighted as well. So just get your copy of Religious Potential of the Child and dive into this really amazing and rich chapter, Chapter 10, The Method of Signs. Today, we have Sue Stolsatz Reese joining us on the podcast. Dive into this rich chapter to explore the depth of what Sophia is trying to show us through the method of signs. I hope you enjoy. Sue, welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. Thank you. It is such a pleasure to be here with you, Carrie. Well, Sue, would you tell us a little bit about who are you and how did you get involved in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Catechesis of the Good Shepherd fell into my lap about 27 years ago now. Oh, wow. My daughter was in Sunday school at our church. I I went and I was helping out and they said, oh, we want you to come and see this thing that we're thinking about doing called Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. And I, I couldn't go that day. <laughs> and so people went and they started to bring it back to our church. And I thought, oh, I really want that. And it, it worked out so that I did get to have it. And it just fell into my lap, as I say. I was a, a pharmacist with three children. I had no intention of doing anything with religious education or formation or, or working with children, and yet I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> you were hooked. I was hooked. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited about this episode. You and I were just speaking before about this chapter, chapter 10 of Religious Potential of a Child on the Method of Signs. I think I've said this for each chapter that there's so many things I wish that we could just read because I don't think that we could do give Sophia's words justice. But there, this chapter, I feel like we could do a book study just on this chapter especially for those of us who have done any other type of formation or any other type of maybe a te being a teacher, kind of that de-schooling that we talk about this chapter is kind of the, the central point of that, where you could get everything you need for the de-schooling by really diving into this method of signs, really how Jesus taught. Absolutely. So many times I've had children come to the atrium and I'll pose a question and they'll be looking for that one right answer that will make me go on mm -hmm. to the next thing. And after a while, they learn that there is no one right answer. And I never give any answers at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's usually it's funny because you, you kind of get to that point with the kids like in February or March, and they finally kind of get like, oh, there's no wrong answer. And then it's almost the end of the year. <laughs> and the other side of that is that it's really left me open to hear some wonderful things from the children that I would have missed otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you go in there with thinking you already know the answer, then yeah, you've kind of closed yourself off to what they might have to say. And they've said some really um, astonishing things sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this chapter on page 126 of the third edition, even Sophia talks about it when she says, the Africans in a village in Chad who were used to the old style of catechism remarked to the catechist who presented the parables to them. With you, everything is different. It is not just a matter of learning. <laughs> it's not just learning. It's it's a matter of sitting, sitting with it. And what does it say to you? And of being co-listeners and really um, finding a, a kind of e equality 
having the, the child have an equality with us. And that is what will help them to be listening forever instead mm-hmm. of just listening until they get the one right answer. Right, right. Well, in this chapter, Sophia speaks about how the method needs to be equal to the content. Would you speak about what does that mean? Well, for me, that's meant, you know, how do we talk about God? I could never describe God in a, any kind of a coherent, succinct way, tie it down to a definition. What I can do is I can invite children and even adults in the formation classes I give to come and listen together and find God for themselves. And one of the ways that we do that is through these signs, which I have often thought was one of the most incredible ways God makes his presence known. Mm -hmm. In a little bit of bread, Mm -hmm. in water, in consecrated oils, things that we can see and touch and taste and feel. And yet we understand that there is much more behind that than the part that we can see and taste and feel. Mm -hmm. And it helps bring us us into that relationship with a, a God that we want to know more about always. Yeah. There's just this never ending possibilities that are behind each of these signs, because that ends definition of God. There's this never ending possibility of who you are or what does this gift mean of um, the depths of all of that go so far beyond what our words are capable of. And so we have these beautiful signs in order to communicate without words, this never ending depth. Never ending. And it helps make us equal to the toddler, perhaps, who is just learning some words and can't express everything they want to with their words. We can't express everything we want to about God with our words either. Right, right. I remember as a parent, when my oldest first started in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, um, the coordinator told us to not ask our child, what did you do in the atrium? Because this three-year-old cannot express in words what they encountered while in this space. And so that that question kind of loads the child up for failure because they feel like there was something that I needed to produce. There was something that I needed to um, articulate about what just happened between me and God in this atrium. And so to be cautious of those kind of questions, because what signs and parables and prayer alludes to is beyond words. Yes, I have often said that um, I've spent most of my time working with three to six-year-olds and and now even younger in the atrium. And what they really show me is how to be present with God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I found very fascinating at the very beginning of this chapter was when Sophia was speaking almost about the history of catechesis not not specifically Good Shepherd, just catechesis in general, and how the founders of our faith and Jesus himself, they, they use signs in order to catechize because God is beyond what we can articulate. But then throughout time, especially after the late Middle Ages, it has become, let's see if I can, I'll just say what Sophia says because she says it so much better. Um catechesis became the transmission of propositions already solved and enunciated in synthetic form. There was nothing left for the person to do, but to receive them as they were without committing oneself on a personal level beyond the effort to memorize. Having abandoned the language of images used by the great church fathers, catechesis fell into formulaism. That was very fascinating to me. To me, too. Which of us hasn't had a child ask about how science and religion, for example, fit together? Mm -hmm. And they fit together so beautifully, but not in any kind of a neat formula. Nothing that that you can prove in that way. And Mm -hmm. yet um, 
everything in the universe points to its maker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it takes that like self-discovery, like sitting with the universe and or and finding God. If somebody sits there and points and says, there is God, um, or this is what God is, this is what God means, that discovery or what she, what she calls um, nothing left for the person to do. There's nothing left for them to do whenever the answers are just handed to you. And the method of signs is this beautiful ability for you to sit and answer that question at this moment in my life. And what is God saying to me in my heart about who he is, who I am, the world around me? What does it all mean? I think it was St. Augustine that said, if you think that you have understood God, what you have understood is is not God. <laughs> Go sit with that a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> if you think you've got them all figured out. So, Sue, how do we live out this method of science? How do we do this in our faith? Oh, well, the one of the simplest things is the way that you and I began our prayer before we sat down to do this recording, just making that simple sign of the cross that mm -hmm. we, we know so well. And yet, in that particular gesture, what we're saying is that we're uniting ourselves to you, God, and we're giving ourselves over. So this is becoming um, your work more so than the work of Sue and Carrie, mm -hmm. as much as we can possibly let go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So through this sign, through this sign, sign of the cross, we are saying something even deeper. We are saying something even deeper. Mm -hmm. And we see that throughout our whole, everything that we do. We do. Um, there was a little girl this past year, her mother um, called after one of our atrium sessions. We had actually taken the children outside to look for crosses in the environment. And uh, one of the assistants had shown children how to stand in the sun and stretch their arms out and make crosses with their body. And the mother called and she said, I don't know what you're doing in there, <laughs> but my kid is different. She is looking for crosses everywhere and seeing Jesus everywhere and mm. even making crosses with her body. And this is better than anything we've done before. So keep it up. Mm -hmm. I love that. Seeing Jesus everywhere. I love that. And, and that's what we all need is to see Jesus everywhere because there are enough places in our world where we will see things that are not as pleasant and we need those reminders that Jesus is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can train our eye. Train our eye. Yeah. And Sophia speaks just about that in this chapter about how to like, how important it is for us to teach the children to see the signs all around us and what God is saying through, whether it's in our church, whenever you see like the bread and wine, or you see the water, or you see the sign of the cross, or is it in the sunset, or is it in the, the mustard seed and how it grows into the big tree, or the garden that you have outside with your family, like teaching the children to see what God is saying through those things. And let's see if I can find the line that she... I know what we could highlight this whole chapter. Seriously, it's so true. Um, <laughs> she says, uh, she's oh, well. She's it says something about how if we don't teach the children to see the signs throughout the universe, then it's all flat. And how important it is to train our eyes and help the children to train their eyes in order to see the signs, because then you see the depth behind all of the signs, rather than just it's a mustard seed, you see, there's a kingdom of God behind that seed. There is. And not just the mustard seed in, in the seeds you're planting in your garden. Uh, I was thinking of this earlier, how, you know, everything that we plant tends towards more life, mm -hmm. everything. And that is one of the, the universals in all of created matter is that it tends to, to be more. Mm -hmm. The seed becomes more. Um, people and animals reproduce in different ways. You know, 
Mm-hmm. Always this tendency towards more, more mm-hmm. life. And in this chapter, Sophia speaks about a living sign. And I found that very fascinating, this idea that... Um, Like she compares it to a stop sign and how like we're not going to look at the stop sign. We're not talking about that kind of a sign. Um, She talks about more of a living sign. Can you speak about what that means and what is that the difference between what she means, what a stop sign is compared to our living signs that we find in our faith? Well, we we learned early that a stop sign only has one meaning. You Mm -hmm. see that red octahedron and you know that that means that you must stop Mm -hmm. and it doesn't really go beyond any meaning beyond there it's just this sign means stop um when my grandson would ride with me in the car when he was little he knew that a green light meant go right but uh these living signs they can have one meaning at one time in your life or one sitting, and they can point you in another little direction at another time. They have different layers of, of meaning. Thinking of just um, bread, which nourishes our, our bodies and is certainly a sign of love and care in all times, and that in the Eucharist also becomes a, a further sign of love and care and and nourishment, not for our bodies, but for our spirit. Mm -hmm. Or thinking of water that has so many meanings. Um, Mm -hmm. Certainly we need it to live. It helps to clean us. It refreshes us. It's so enjoyable just to walk by any source of water. We know with a with children, if if they get to feeling a little out of uh, sorts, we want to take them outdoors or put them in water because that will change their attitudes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then water also has a whole opposite dimension. Yeah, you can drown. Mm-hmm. And the whole idea of like the flood and this like the cleaning that could be deadly, but it could also be refreshing. And like the, the multi-element behind the sign of water has layers behind it yes it it can also be responsible for erosion and for destruction and for all of those things Mm -hmm. yeah so sitting with that and what is god saying with the flood what is god saying in baptism what is god saying with the the little bit of water that we add to the chalice when water has all of these dimensions to it this like beautiful living sign of water and we can sit with all of that Mm mm-hmm Mm-hmm. And that's just one sign. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even talked about fire or right. <laughs> or bread or grapes or <laughs> or any of those other signs. Or the oils, yeah. Or the oils. So many. <laughs> so many signs. So many signs. So many signs. But you know, you had uh, spoken about um, the little bit of water in the chalice, and I was. Um, with some six to nine-year-old children earlier this year. And I hadn't expected the chalice to come up at all when we were talking about the parable of the true vine. Mm -hmm. But there we were meditating on what it meant to be so closely united and to be remaining with Jesus. And one little boy piped up, well, it's the chalice. And he went and he got the chalice from the Mm -hmm. atrium and brought it over to where we were gathered said, it's right here. We're in the chalice with Jesus. And I thought, this is exactly why I like this method of signs. Because if I was looking for that one right answer, and we'd gotten to it, we would have cut off all access to this. Mm -hmm. And it was profound, and it was beautiful. And it was him telling me something. Mm -hmm. The fact that there wasn't one answer, you would have cut off from the dozens and dozens of possibilities of the ways that God could be speaking to you or to the children, not to you. Maybe it said something in their heart that you never even heard before. Oh, I'm sure there are lots of things in their hearts that are never expressed that are just between them and God. And that is a wonderful thing to facilitate. Mm -hmm. It's that humility that we always have to talk about as as catechists is one that we as humble 
servants, we do not have the answer to give. There's a humility in that. Like we're not, if we had, if we, if we had took on the attitude that I have the answer and I'm hoping that you will get to it, that's such a sense of pride on our part. But as the humble servants next, sitting next to the children, um, we have to take on this attitude of, I don't know the answer. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is saying in your heart right now when we sit with the true vine parable. And also humble that you, little child, might have something that's going to touch my heart. And they do it all the time. It's why I've stayed all these years. Yeah. (laughs) It's so true. It's our own personal formation. So, Sue, would you speak into, we've kind of alluded to it a little bit, but would you speak more into how... We live into this method of sign with the children in the atrium, but also in our homes. How can we do that with our children? Oh, yes. In the atrium, one of the easiest ways I think we live into this method of sign is is with the gestures. And we'd alluded before about the sign of the cross. And when we uh, are working with the children and we're talking about, for example, the sign of the cross that was done on our foreheads during baptism. We might say, "This is, I'm going to make this sign on you, and I'm going to use my thumb because it is the strongest finger. And even though this is a sign that gets made on our skin, where does this sign go, really? Mm-hmm. And they usually, not always, say that it goes to their heart. And I don't really wait for an answer. It's not about the answer. It's about mm-hmm. posing the question. And so I was uh, thinking about that some weeks ago when I was sitting in a family adoration hour and the children and the parents were going off into little corners of the church so that they could uh, speak with one another and bless one another with the same sign. And just thinking about the sweetness of that and how they were seeing this this sign and doing it. And we don't have to be in a church to be able to have those moments with our families. We can do those at bedtime, when we get up in the morning, during the day, anytime something um, upsetting has happened or something wonderful has happened. We don't need an excuse mm-hmm. to just take a moment to, to sit with one another and and bless our children and let our children bless us. Mm -hmm. And that's just one of the ways that uh, something that we show in the atrium can easily go out into the home. Mm -hmm. So Sophia speaks about these two poles that are important in the education to the reading of signs. And so whenever I were to do that with my children, what you're speaking about of marking my children with that cross, that was marked at their baptism. So that's one pull, that physical sign of the marking. How do I introduce them to the other pull to help them orient themselves into the depth of that sign of the cross from baptism? Well, you might just say, who do we think of when we think of the cross? Mm. So if I'm making this cross on your body, who am I thinking of making you closer with? Mm. who is with you a couple of weeks after that family empower hour um, the priest that was was there doing it wandered into my atrium one day afternoon just out of the blue wandered in just said he hadn't been there for a while and I told him that because you know he didn't have any family there and I didn't have any family there. I had thought about coming up and and talking and, and blessing him because not only is he my spiritual father, but he is the same age as my father. So, so we talked a, a little bit about how many times that sign had been made over either one of us and the some of the different occasions and how it was just a reminder to always... Be, be marked as who we belong to, mm. the sign of belonging to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that means Jesus belongs to us too. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, when you were talking about marking the children, I was thinking about the Good Shepherd and belonging to the Good Shepherd. It's marking yourself as I am his and he is mine. Yes, always. Always. Man, this chapter, I feel like we have barely skimmed the surface of what this is capable of. Sue, is there anything else from this chapter that you want to lift up before that we finish? Oh, I think people are just going to have to get the book. I think so, too, because it's just so good. It's so rich. And it's and it's only one out of many chapters. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there's a, a hope in here, too, that she writes on page 131. The child will constantly return to the facts we have provided her, making them an ever new object of her meditation in his dialogue with the interior master. And she will reach a high degree of penetration. That's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. It's about the relationship. And that's what signs and parables do as they bring us in to meet somebody and to to find out more about them. Mm -hmm. If we uh, stopped at the level of a stop sign looking for the one right answer, after a little bit of time, I don't think there would be anything to a, a keep attracting us to keep exploring that. And this um, relationship with the Good Shepherd is is one that we want to be foremost in our hearts for our whole life. Right, right. I think this is the reason why we have been so drawn to this method is because it has given us the time and the space and the methodology to sit and re- learn how to read the signs and be able to rediscover and rediscover and rediscover what it is that God is speaking to us behind all of it. Um, this method and this work gives us that ability to do that. You say that, and I'm reminded of the first time I was sitting in a formation class for myself, and we were looking at the gestures of the Mass, and I was thinking, this is what I knew when I was a child— and I had not thought about in decades, and now it is mine again. Mm. You just knew it as a child, and so it's rediscovering what you already knew. Oh, I love that. It was the best. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Well, thank you, Sue. I really appreciate you joining me and helping me just sit with this chapter a little bit more. Thank you, Carrie. I love this chapter. I love this method of signs. And it was so good to uh, to get to join you on the podcast, which I am a big fan of. Thank you. Thank you. It's all because of beautiful people like you. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. We really encourage everyone to get some friends together, some catechists together, some parents together. Get your copies of The Religious Potential of the Child. The newest edition is the third edition. And dive into all of these beautiful chapters. We are using this series that we are in the middle of to help be a supplement to your reading of each of these chapters to help you dive into them because they are full of really rich content. And so I truly believe that the only way to dive into it well is to have great discussions about what's in each of these chapters. So get some friends together so that y'all can discuss what stood out to you in each of these chapters and then use these podcast episodes to help you continue to explore the richness inside each of the each of the chapters. So we have a list on our website that tells you which podcast episodes can correlate with which chapters of Religious Potential of the Child to help aid in your book study this summer. We have a link to that list and a link to how you could purchase Religious Potential of the Child 3rd Edition all in our show notes. We even have some study questions to help with your book study. This week, we are lifting up our benefactor member, the Mustard Seed Training. They are a small group of home-based Christian artisans in Northeast Ohio, who they pray through their making of the materials for children and families in the atria. If you would like to know more about Mustard Seed Training, please go look at our show notes, and we have a link to their website, which is mustseed.org. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. 
We would like to thank all the contributing members because you are making this podcast possible. If you would like to become a member or if you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, you can go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.